What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to the Saturday, March 30th, 2024 edition of the Founders Pod. It's been a crazy week out here. I'm in California. The weather's been nuts. Um, not too much going on for the Bills this week. We do have some stuff in the NFL that we did want to talk about. Um, Akeem, how has your week been, man? How, how are things? Hey, Rich. Akeem Richens. If you don't know him, get to know him. There it is. There it is, man. There it is. DM3. Um, you know, everything is good, man. Everything is good. It's been a, a quiet week for the Bills. Um, and, and it's about that time, right? It's, it's about that time of the offseason where things will simmer down a little bit in terms of trades or uh, free agency signings, especially with the, the amount of cap space or the lack of cap space the Buffalo Bills is dealing with. So it's been a quiet week for the Bills, but we still got a ton to talk about. And it's been a good week overall. Yeah, I got I got thrown off a little bit by the intro. I upgraded. We got some new upgrades mm-hmm. to the show, and there's going to be more coming. So once I get used to this content creating stuff on a weekly basis again, adding some some bells and whistles like the old Billsology used to be. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, there's a couple new rule changes that we want to talk about. We want to talk about the hip drop tackle. We want to talk about the new hybrid kickoff rule that was put mm-hmm. into play for this coming season. And then Akeem and myself, we are going to grade the Buffalo Bills position groups after two and a half, almost three weeks of free agency, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, setting this up for Brandon Bean up for the NFL draft that's coming up here in a few weeks. So let's talk about the hip drop tackle, Akeem. And if everyone's not familiar with this, and before I get Akeem's take on this, actually, before we do that, let's take care of some business. If you guys are watching this on YouTube, please smash the like button. Um, That tells YouTube that you guys like the content we're putting out. Um, That also helps the algorithm so we can get more engagement. Please subscribe. That way you guys are in tune with what's going on with the brand. That also helps the growth of not just our shows and our brand, but also helps get more engagement in the chat. Um, And then please hit the notification bell so you know when the Founders Pod is live, as well as all of the other content on the channel. Um, And when you guys are done watching this show here, go ahead and check out the other content on the channel. There's plenty of it. We got stuff dropping daily. Um, we have some short videos. We have, you know, a few video clips from our live shows. We got live shows every day. If you guys are watching on Facebook. Please smash the like button. Drop comments in there. Um, also, if you can, re- you know, share this. And then if you're watching on X, go ahead and repost, comment, and like this if you can. Yes, the more sir. engagement we get, the better. The better the show will be because we have more to talk about as you guys bring topics to the show that we may or may not want to, to cover as always super chats on YouTube will always get priority. We'll stop what we're doing to mm-hmm. bring those up on the screen. Mm-hmm. So Akeem sent me a video of the hip drop tackle. And if you guys aren't familiar with it, it's something that I think during the season last year was highly talked about as the season progressed about mm-hmm. injuries and prevention of injuries and things like that. So I got a, a short video um, the quality is not great, but you can kind of see what it looks like. Um, and this is from the Kansas City Chiefs and Cincinnati Bengals. This was a tackle on Tyler Boyd. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and play that for you guys. Let's see, right? Um, yeah, I mean, you can't tell from that angle, but this angle right here, you can tell where the defender kind of drags and. Tyler Boyd actually got up and and jogged off. He actually got uh-huh. up and jogged off the field, but then as you saw him there on the sideline, you could tell you there was obviously some discomfort. Now, right. I'm going to ask you a question, then I'm going to have a follow-up question after you answer. So right. what do you think this is going to do to not just the game in general, the flow of the game, but what is this going to do for defenders as far as their tackling and, and everything that they've been taught and how to – do what you can basically to, to bring a guy to the ground. What, what's your thoughts on that aspect of it? So let's run that. Let's run that play. Let's run that play one, one more time. See if I could talk this play through, right? Catches the board, tell the board. He makes his cut. Once he makes his cut, that's, I believe that's Reed. He's trying to make, he's attempting to make the tackle. I'm at the point of, you know, uh, obviously not professional, not obviously not collegiate, but, you know, I have some organizational uh, skills in terms of playing football, high school ball in a competitive league back in the past. And I'm looking at that as a defender and I'm saying to myself, how are defenders going to defend? And that is my main concern here right now. And I understand we want to we want to uh, uh, protect the players and we want to make sure that they are 
uh, healthy as, as they can be playing the combative sport. But at the same time, it is a combative sport. And it is unfortunate these players get hurt during those situations. But in my opinion, you're, you're taking more away from the defender and you add in more advantages to the offensive player. Now what happens if you catch a slant and uh, Jalen Waddle runs past you? What, what are, are, right. are the defenders going to second guess themselves as they're grabbing the player? Is it going to be easier to score? So I, as much as it's unfortunate that the the players get hurt and the amount of players do get hurt on that type of tackle, I, I, I'm a, I got to call a spade a spade. I'm not a fan. I'm, I, I'm not a fan. Maybe the defense, the defender in me feel this way, but I'm I, I'm not a fan of this rule at all. And uh, at some point, you you, you got to play football if you want to protect the defenders. If you want to protect the players, you know, put grass in the stadiums. Put grass on right. all, in all two thirty all thirty two fields. If you're trying, if you're really trying to protect players, like you're trying to protect players, because it looks like to me is you're looking for another reason the NFL to find players and make more money. Uh, finding players in, in uh, within the NFL guidelines because uh, uh, I don't like I don't like it at all. I, I my opinion of this is coming from a league that has done everything they can to make it an offensively driven league, and they've given the offense so many advantages. Whether it's the late hits on the quarterbacks, whether it's the the roughing the passer, or if it's the any of the stuff that they've done in the last you know, handful of years, right? It's made it so that the offense has more of an advantage. So how can you, in open field, like you said, and this is going to be my second question for you, how are you supposed to tackle a guy like Josh Allen who's coming at you full speed? Are you just going to get out of the way? Because you're going to want to try to wrap him up somehow. And if he's moving his full 260 plus, whatever he is, Mm -hmm. you're going to slide down. Is that mm -hmm. going to be considered a hip drop tackle? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. those type of things are going to happen. And I thought about Josh a lot because there's a lot of times when he's being tackled and he's still moving and he's this momentum. He's still going. You just see guys slide down. So what, in, in your opinion, is, is this something that's a positive, put a positive spin on it for the bills because we mm -hmm. see our athletic physical quarterback mm -hmm. breaking containment getting, you know, challenging defenders in open field. Is this something you think that's a, a benefit for somebody like Josh Allen? Uh, it's uh, honestly, I think it's a benefit for all offensive players involved. <laughs> you know, it's, you, you know, your receiver, your running back, once you get a certain angle, once you once you get to a certain, pl certain place where now the defenders got to use their closing speed, right? Now they have to think, they have to be cognizant while they play in the game, while they're, understanding if they're in cover three or, or cover four and you have Tyreek Hill that you have to be worried about and you might have deep thirds or you might have to cover uh, the, uh, uh, a quarter of the field. You have to worry about your responsibilities and then you have to be cognizant of making the correct tackle in in a uh, 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 full capacity. And that is something for defenders, that is something that's going to be very difficult to do, especially when these offensive players are getting bigger and faster and stronger. And again, I understand uh, the naysayers that may disagree, or I understand the people that did implement this new rule because of injury. But if we're going to do that, I think, like I alluded to earlier, we need to take further steps to ensure player safety. And that starts with the football fields and the grass. I know I spoke about it earlier, but it, it, it seems to me that we're, we're micromanaging how we want to take care of the ability and health of NFL players. I mean, we, we've seen it firsthand. You talk about the field conditions. We've seen it firsthand twice with Tredavious White and with Vaughn Miller, like two players that meant a huge amount to what the bills do on defense. And we lost Trey twice and we lost Vaughn. Who knows what the season, that whole season with Vaughn would have looked like. And mm -hmm. do we know if that's reshaped the rest of his career? We don't know. And that's the thing, my fault, Dave. And that's no, the thing. Good, that, and that's the thing about it, right? We see in all these hip drop tackles that result in the injury and what happens, what the, the rules are implemented and things are changed. Right. But now we've been seeing, grass and turf and football fields injuring players yeah. so how come we're not doing what we need to do to take care of that aspect as well and 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 we're just 
focusing on hip drop shackles? Is it because now the NFL has to shed out money of their own to get these problems resolved and they don't right. want to do all that? That's when they want to delay the process. So it's just a lot of other questions that come up when they implement rules like this. I mean, I'll tell you flat out, it's because if you're talking about putting grass in every stadium, that comes out of the owner's pockets. And the NFL is not going to go to the owners and say, we need you to pay for new turf in your fields. It's just, it's just not going to happen. Right. To us, it makes sense. Right. How many times, how many, how many good players, all pro pro bowl starting players have we seen just, they miss their entire season because they tear an ACL because of horrible field conditions, because that turf over in London was terrible. And we, that's, that's where injuries happened. I mean, I, I can go on and on about that, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about the the kickoff rule. And I got a video that kind of shows because I think some people are still kind of in the dark and me and Akeem were even reading over the rules for the 57th time before mm -hmm. we went live. Some of it makes sense. Some of it, you're going to have to just kind of go with the flow when the game's happening to try to understand where the ball lands and stuff like that. But I'll show you guys a video of what the formation lining up for the kick is going to look like. And this is from the XFL. kind of weird i don't a lot, of people are, a lot of people are excited thinking this is going to spark more returns the xfl had one kickoff return for a touchdown last year like it's i know it's the xfl i mean uh -huh. Uh -huh. you could smash on it all you want whatever uh -huh. one way or the other but i think this is going to cause more injuries if i'm being honest i really? think that there's going to be guys That's that aren't point. prepared okay. for what's going to happen and this is like a new rule that they're going to have to practice that they're going to and and some team is just not going to be prepared and somebody's going to get hurt. That's just my opinion. I don't think it's going to increase the, the kickoff return because I, you can still blast the kick out of the end zone and it just, instead of being at the 25, it's at the 30. So it's not, it's not like that's changing much. So I don't know. What's, what's your thoughts on it? Now, isn't that something I spoke about the word micromanaging, right? We spoke about one, we spoke about one rule change that's trying to, protect the players and on the other hand is this rule change that can possibly put players in right. harm's way and i i do agree with that a hundred percent dave but i'm going to tell you i like the rule i i yeah. I, I like the rule i'm, I'm kind of old school right i know i'm not as old as certain people you know but still <laughs> <laughs> i'm still old school and i believe man it, football is football if you signed up to yeah. play the game Agreed. If you, it, 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 this is this is what comes with the territory. It's a hundred percent chance that you're going to have some type of injury throughout your course of career playing football. What type of injury you get, you don't know until you know. But it's a combative sport, man, and I think the NFL should remain that way. I hope it doesn't turn into you know two hand touch and and flag football. And fifteen football. years from now, we're talking about flag football and the Olympics and all this stuff. Hopefully, it doesn't turn into that, man. I I, I actually like the rule. I think it would. Now, uh, that's an excellent statistic you brought up. XFL only had one touchdown with that. Um, kickoff rule implemented, but I think it brings some more excitement to the NFL. I believe now when uh, there's there, there's plays to be had and the Miami Dolphins are down late to the Buffalo Bills, down three, and the Bills have to kick it off. I think you'll see Tyreek Hill back there. And right. having Tyreek Hill back there, it brings, the it, 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 it brings some more excitement to the game and to the NFL. And I want to see how players perform or I want to see what special players can be developed because this rule is implemented. So I, I like it. We'll, we'll see where we, where it goes. Are we to a point with the NFL where we just need to stop changing everything? Like it seems like every year something happens some, and it will happen this year throughout the 2023 season. There was a bunch of things that happened that they had, at the owners meetings, they had discussions about changing rules. It seems like every single year, something isn't executed correctly the season before. So let's change it. And what never seems to change is officiating. It's gotten drastically worse. And I know this isn't the, the topic that we were talking about, but when are we going to start making it so that we're holding these referees accountable? And I think if the game's being called the right way, I think we get a whole better product on the field. But no, the NFL is trying to change all these rules to make the game more exciting. But I, I don't I don't like just continuously like 
moving the goalposts, right? Mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. they're they're just trying to keep up with the Joneses. I mean, the NFL shits on the XFL, but here they are adapting a rule from the X. It's literally the same rule from the XFL. Like it's, right. it's they saw that it was popular, it created a buzz, and people liked it. It was different. But at, at what point are we going to watch the NFL product and not even recognize the game that we're watching because everything is so different? The kickoff's now different. The, you can't tackle a certain way. You can't hit a quarterback. I mean, defenseless receivers. Guys are getting kicked out for taunting. Like, we're doing – it's a game. Like, let these guys play and let it – there was nothing wrong with the NFL product 10 years ago. And now we have all these changes. I mean – I say that on one hand, but I say this on the other hand. I'm glad they changed the overtime rule. I, I, I call it the Josh rule because that was something I think needed to be addressed. But I don't know. I just I, – I don't like constant changing I just mm-hmm. in the NFL. Like everything seems to be new, and then every team has to adapt. And it's, it's just – I don't know. I guess the best team adapts. The cream rises to the top. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I, we're good on that. All right, so let's move into position groups. And – this is something me and Akeem wanted to do because, first off, there wasn't a lot going on this week. Um, we were going to talk about Sean McDermott. Um, we were going to talk about Jordan Poyer in 13 seconds, but we thought that stuff was getting kind of played out already on social media. So we wanted to grade the position groups um, because I feel like the Bills aren't going to do a heck of a lot more um, in free agency before the draft when it comes to anything super significant, um, guys that are going to get – decent sized contracts and contribute to, you know, or compete to start. Um, obviously beans going to fill the roster out to 90 by training camp. So that some of these guys come in are going to be deaf pieces. So Akeem, with that being said, we're going to go through every position group. Where do you want to start? Uh, let's, you know, let's start with our engine, our heartbeat, our franchise quarterback. Uh, the, let's start with the quarterback position group for the Buffalo Bills. i start with uh, Josh Allen and Mitchell Trubisky. All right, so let's get Mitch Trubisky out of the way. So we touched on it a couple weeks ago when we talked about the free agent signings. How do you feel about the signing? We don't have to spend too much time on it. Do you think it's, uh, you know, it's somebody that it made sense, right? He was in the system before. I complained on that show that why don't they just sign somebody long term instead of doing this merry-go-round every single year? I understand the salary cap restraints and all that stuff, but is Mitch the right guy to back up Josh? Um, is he the right guy? I hope we would never know because the durability of Josh Allen would stay true. But um, in terms of being the right guy, I believe he's a solid backup. You know, I don't think, you know, you, you're going to win a championship with Mitch Trubisky as your starting quarterback. I don't think he can pull off a Nick Foles late in the playoffs. You want to have Josh Allen in there when the games and, and uh, matter most. But uh a spot starter maybe uh, here and there, you know, one, maybe two games at most if he if we need that. Uh, I think he could come in and at least give us uh, 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 one win out the two wins if he had to come in and play. Uh, Two-year deal. Uh, I like the deal um, in terms of, you know, more years. Let's stop playing around with our backup quarterback every year, just fluctuating quarterbacks right. every year to, to, to back up Josh. So I, I, I do like that. He's familiar with the city, familiar with the system, familiar with the coaching staff. So I'm not opposed to the Mr. Trubisky sign, and I, I, I like it. I like it. Yeah, I think just bringing somebody in, we talked about this, you know, time on task. He's been here. He, he knows Josh. They have a, a decent relationship from what we've seen. So the film room is probably good. The quarterback room is probably good. Practice is probably good. Um, you know, he was here when Brady was the, the QB coach. So it's it's familiar, right? And it's something, like you said, I don't – knock on wood, um, we have the most durable quarterback in the NFL in Josh Allen. He has not missed a game since his rookie season. Um, he holds the current streak for most starts consecutively by a quarterback – but I will say, and I don't want to, I hate doing this because he got injured two years ago. We know about the elbow injury. He got injured last year. We know about the shoulder injury. We know how physical he is and likes to be. Um, I think this is an extremely important position on the Buffalo Bills. We talk about it. Akeem, you and me talk about this all the time. That it is, it is an important position because mm-hmm. of the quarterback that we have. And I'm glad that they lock somebody in for two years. That way we don't have to have this conversation next off season, unless they talk about getting rid of Mitch to save money or something like that. So um, I will, 
I will say this, right? We talk we, as as we're talking about Mitch Trubisky and as we're talking about him on a two year contract. I believe this is the year where, if I'm the Buffalo Bills staff, I would take some time and and probably draft the quarterback, a developmental quarterback, late, and I'll see if I can develop him while Trubisky's on under contract for the next two years. I want to see if I could develop that guy to be the backup for Josh uh, Allen uh, moving forward. So while you have that two-year window, I would love for the Buffalo Bills to to add that developmental piece of uh, Jordan Travis from Florida State or one of those guys that has athletic traits and can, and can do similar things to that Josh can do. So, Yeah, put him on the practice squad for two years. Mm-hmm. Let him learn the system. Let him watch – Josh Allen play for two years. He doesn't have to do the same things, but he has to understand the playbook and, you know, develop into something that he can be, and we can have him under control for four years if we want to, Uh Um, you know, and he's cheap. He's a lot cheaper than Mitch Trubisky. And I I think that they tried that in the past and it just, it never worked out. So, all right. So that leads us to Josh Allen. This can go a multitude of ways. This can go for the entire show, or we can kind of just, ease back on some of the stuff that I wanted to say, because I think I I would go down a dark alley um, just because I'm sick of constantly defending Josh Allen on, on social media, mainly X because all the chiefs fans and dolphins fans and Bengals fans want to just be in my mentions all the time. Whenever I say anything about Josh Allen. So I'm going to, I'm going to post something by all of our favorite national media personalities i'm being sarcastic but the point is there so i'm gonna put this up there so nick wright this week said if you don't think josh allen is a top three quarterback you're a hater but if you judge the bills like they have a top three quarterback you're being unfair Mm. so does that does that resonate with you? Like, does that make sense? I, I hate the guy, but I think that absolutely makes sense if you're looking at Josh Allen from outside of being a Buffalo Bills fan. Because Josh Allen from 2000, I want to say the 2022 season, through what he's at now, take away the play, take take away the play on the field. He's become like the second face of the NFL with all the sponsorships, with all the commercials, with just being this bigger than life person. And I think sometimes the national media gets some of that stuff stuck in their head. And I don't want to spend too much time on that aspect of it, but they get that part of it stuck in their head. And I think opposing teams fans are sick of seeing Josh Allen, just like we were sick of seeing Patrick Mahomes everywhere, right? He was all over TV all the time. If it was, even if it wasn't even a chiefs game, he was all over the place. Right. So he, he was being forced fed down your throat. Now I'm not sick of it, obviously, because he's our quarterback. Um, but do you take what he says, what Nick Wright says there? Do you take that a certain way? Do you agree? Do you disagree? And what's your opinion, you know, leading into the national media's perception of who Josh Allen is? Because like I said, before we came on, it's 50, 50. Either you like, either the national media personalities are on board with what he's doing, like a Dan Orlovsky. He will tell you exactly what he's doing. Or are you on the side of people who still don't believe, you know, what he's doing and all that type of stuff? What's your What's your take overall on Josh, I guess? Josh overall Allen. evaluation. Um. I know what, it's a it's a, a random ass question and it's so it but it, so, but it, in so many ways. Of course, of course, but I I think I have to disagree with you because and, what I, and, and I have to disagree with Nick Wright as well because if we're really thinking about it, Josh Allen was scrutinized since. Draft day. He was yeah, scrutinized Wyoming. since yeah. Wyoming. He's been yeah. scrutinized uh, since the Senior Bowl. He's been scrutinized by high touted, so to speak, that people would listen to and take heed to media pundits and they spoke poorly about him. You can't teach accuracy. You can't teach certain things. Right. So I think he got that scrutiny. So now when he's propelled himself into a superstar player. This is the type of treatment 
superstars players get. He's earned that. He didn't earn the scrutiny he was getting before he came to the NFL. Yes, we understand that he may have limit uh, 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 deficiencies in his game right now. But just like everybody else, I, a lot of people didn't get scrutinized as much or as harshly Josh Allen was in the past. Now you propel yourself to a superstar quarterback. Guess what? It, we have to call certain things a spade, right? A spade, a spade here. There is things, there are components that lead to why people talk about Josh Allen, right? Number one, the Buffalo Bills fan base is the best fan base in the world, right? That, that helps when you have the backing of the best fan base in the world. Number two, uh, uh, he's a generational quarterback, he can he can run he can he can jump he can he can throw he make these incredible plays right he plays don't don't get me wrong it's not the same but imagine if it was new york city you don't think people would be talking about josh allen just as much right, right? he plays in a new york market josh allen is a handsome guy he looks like clark kent <laughs> right so when you have all these things going for you, you have your generational talent. You're you're playing with the 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 the, the best under the with the best fan base in the world. You're you're handsome. You're good looking. You're a franchise quarterback. You you you're you're dating superstar celebrity actresses. When when you have all these things, you're going to garner that attention right. and. I, I think all that attention is warranted. And just like everybody else, unlike everybody else, when Josh Allen isn't playing well, right? The scrutiny is is a lot higher for him. They dig at him a little bit more than they would dig at other people because it's Josh Allen. So we have to take the good with the bad with Josh Allen as, as fans. And I think media or outside fans or, ba or fans and media pundits and outlets that's not a part of Bill's Mafia, they have to take the good that come with Josh Allen as well. Because when it's bad, we're going to hear them. So right. when it's good, they have to hear us. That's how it goes. I think too, it, it's, it's a lot harder for us because we waited so long to finally end the quarterback carousel and have a guy I think, though, it's also bittersweet for us because we have a guy who essentially is Buffalo. Mm -hmm. He was somebody who was counted out. He was somebody who was told he was he was wildly inaccurate and his mechanics were terrible and he was never going to be a starting quarterback in the NFL. He was he was barely recruited at all. He, he got two offers for college and then Brandon Bean moves up and goes and gets the guy and half or probably two thirds of bills fans thought that they took the wrong guy. Um, and then the legend of Josh Allen grew uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to shoot from the hip here. I had issues a couple seasons in a row with the turnovers, with the, the fumbles and the interceptions, but I can I'm here to tell you right now that I don't, I don't give a shit <clears throat> about the 18 interceptions last year. Because if the Bills won the Super Bowl last year, that means absolutely nothing. That means absolutely nothing. And if you watch how Josh Allen transforms into a completely different quarterback in the postseason, that is something that I don't understand why the national media does not push that narrative at all. If you want to talk about clutch mm -hmm. and they want to talk about interceptions, talk about what he's done in his postseason career. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, in his postseason career. He's arguably one of the best statistically that's ever played the game. And I, I understand the, the fairness of comparing him to certain players, certain legends like John Elway and Dan Marino and all the records are falling and Cam Newton and stuff like that. But to your point, there's not been a quarterback that has ever played in the NFL. And this is not a homer take. This is something that I, I could write a book about. There's not been a quarterback that's ever graced an NFL field that is the package that is Josh Allen. There's just not. There's no way that a man that is that size, that looks that like just unphysical when he's running, right? We all make fun mm -hmm. of his, his combine 40 run. Like he looks like Forrest Gump, right? 
but it's unstoppable. There, there's no quarterback that's ever been put on an NFL field besides Josh Allen that can do the things he does. We bitch and complain about the turnovers, but yet we will talk for weeks about the two throws that he makes that nobody else can make. We bitch and complain about the fumbles, but when he runs for 53 yards against the Pittsburgh Steelers in the playoffs, all we do is run those highlights for weeks and weeks and weeks. And, and I guess to kind of wrap a bow on this and, you know, we were going to grade all these. It's an A plus, but the national media seems to, like you said, maybe it's because he's become big, larger than life, like Patrick Mahomes. So they have to find wrinkles to kind of unravel, to kind of make problems where there isn't problems. I just don't like the disrespect that a lot of these national pundits give Josh Allen because I think they still don't believe. I think they're still waiting for something to happen to where he's not going to be the guy that he is. I mean, I don't know what else he's got to do. Um, increasingly, every year, he's scoring more touchdowns. He He's improving you know, dramatically on the things that he was really bad at when he came out of college. So to me, it's, it's, you know, we could have done a whole show on this. Uh -huh. We had a lot prepared, but I, I know we got other topics to talk about, but I, uh -huh. I, just, I don't, I don't believe the criticism is fair. And th there's one stat that I saw today and I'll end it with this is that the bills have won the AFC East four years in a row without Josh Allen. That doesn't happen. The Miami dolphins with Dan Marino, won the AFC East four times in 18 years. So these are the types of things that people bring up and compare, but they always try to throw an asterisk in there because, you know, how, whatever narrative they want to push, Josh Allen's the real deal. And, I, and I'm here to tell you that he's going to, he's going to be in the hall of fame. There's, there's no doubt in my mind that he will be in the hall of fame. The one thing that I, I that needs to go with him is a couple Lombardies at least. Of to course. be considered one of the greatest quarterbacks of all times. And I understand wins are not QB stats, but that's what he's going to be stacked up against. Because uh -huh. when you compare him postseason to Patrick Mahomes right now, uh -huh. you pull up all the stats you want. They The, the Chiefs kingdom will kill you with, with the three Lombardis. Uh -huh. And they have every right to. So uh -huh. anything else you want to talk about with Josh? Um, no, I think we, you know, we touched on everything we needed to touch on with Josh. I think he's uh, – He's a generational talent. I believe that, you know, he a generational talent that picks up his level of play, like you said, in the postseason. But just in the regular season, his numbers, you know, were were pretty damn good as well. People want to harp on the 18 interceptions. People want to harp on the, you know, the seven fumbles. But that's actually a career low in Josh Allen's six seasons. Uh, he had 13 fumbles the year before that. People want to harp on his 27 interceptable, interceptable passes, which is second in the NFL. And are those things that uh, in, in a perfect world we will want to decrease or get down? Yes. But when you have a player like Josh Allen, you have to let Josh be Josh. And you have to take the the great that come with the bad sometimes, that are, come with the – the rough stretch or the tough decisions makings he does make when he throws interceptions sometimes. The the offensive statistics that he puts up, the numbers that he put up uh is joined, right? First in deep ball attempts, he's for uh eighth in red zone attempts, he's first in air yards. Last season he had 21 money throws, which was ninth in the NFL. And for those that do not know what a money throw is, is a it's a completed pass in a in a got to have it moment, got to have it situation. And basically a clutch situation and josh is ninth overall in that third in uh, qbr eighth in true completion percentage third in accuracy rating versus man and zone so we're talking about a guy that you know that has his struggles at times but overall he's a great overall player and his statistics back him up because he's top 10 in a bunch of important significant statistical categories you know i mean we just have to face the facts as Bills fans that this is who Josh Allen is. He's going to be that guy that's going to go and give you all the stuff that you just ripped off. He's going to be a next-gen stat machine. That's who he is. He's going to be a fantasy football hero every single year. We have to also understand he's going to be that guy that wants to play hero ball sometimes. That's just how he's built. It's in his DNA. He's going to make a stupid throw. But I can tell you right now, at any point in any game, if the Bills are trailing in the fourth quarter, I have the utmost confidence that because we have Josh Allen, there is going to be a chance. 
and he's proven me wrong so many times. One one in particular time I can remember that I was in our built in Buffalo group chat was the greatest postseason football game of all time, the Bills and Chiefs. And it sucks that they're on the wrong end of that. But how many times, Akeem, was I in that chat when the Bills were down? I was like, this this is not looking good. And then Josh would deliver. Josh would deliver. Josh would deliver. And you can say that about any kind of e- – look at the Eagles game this past, this past season. Like, what else can a quarterback do to beat a team – when nobody else on your team is trying to help you win, the defense sure as shit wasn't. The offense, other than Josh and you know the receivers he was throwing to, sure as hell wasn't trying to win that game. The offensive line wasn't trying to win that game. Special teams wasn't trying to win that game. Mm-hmm. So it's stuff like that where we have to just appreciate what he does. And I think we just have to understand that there's going to be times when it's not going to be – the best version of Josh Allen, but mm-hmm. that's going to be so far outweighed by the spectacular things that he's going to do for us. And I'm not just sitting on a soapbox here preaching about our quarterback. It's just, he's proven me wrong time and time again. He's proven the doubters wrong. The stuff that the man can do on the football field is ridiculous. And we talk about the accuracy mm-hmm. and I was one during the draft process in 2018, Akeem can vouch for it. I said, the man's accuracy is terrible mm-hmm. and you can't fix that. Mm-hmm. But then he goes out and he makes these pinpoint throws that you're like, holy shit, nobody, I've never seen that before. Mm-hmm. Never seen it a play extended like that and a throw made like that. So mm-hmm. we have to take some of the bad with a lot of good. Mm-hmm. Um, and on that note, I guess we can move on. Yes, sir. Um, I think maybe we should do offense, defense. We'll kind of go back and forth. Back and what forth? do you think? Yeah, definitely. Let's do it. All right. So on defense, I'll pick, um, I'll pick this one. Let's talk about linebackers. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like the room is kind of rounded out really good. What's your initial thought on the linebacking roster? We got Matt Milano, Terrell Bernard, Nicholas Morrow, Balen Spector, and Dorian Williams. We're not going to name all the guys with future contracts and practice squad. We're, we're going, tr- you know, guys that we think are going to be starting competing, you know, going into camp, the guys that are going to be on the roster. So what's your thoughts? So last year, this time when Tremaine Edmonds was uh, a free agent, he ultimately ended up going to the Chicago Bears. You look at the Buffalo Bills linebacking core and you're like, this, this is not good. Well, who, who we, what free agent we're going to bring in? Who's going to replace Tremaine Edmonds? This guy, Terrell Bernard, is a third-round guy. Why did we select him? Can he play middle? Can he do what Tremaine Edmonds did? Can he full hold down the fort? Can he communicate and man the defense in his second year in the NFL um, playing middle linebacker for Super Bowl contending Buffalo Bills? And I think a lot of questions was answered last year with Terrell Bernard, right? We, he's proven that he can man the fort. He can play middle. He can do a bunch of different things, show aggressiveness and shoot gaps and make tackles and uh, uh, drop back, hook the curl, uh, cover guys and man. He can do a multitude of things that I think in the Sean McDermott Dermot play call in defense, we'll figure out who call plays later on, right? Uh, he was able to be successful. And now I'm looking at the overall core with uh, Milano and Balen Spector and Dorian Williams and L- Nicholas Moreau. It, it went from last year. I had no idea till this year. This might be the most comfortable position group I'm with in terms of the linebacking core. We got a healthy Matt Milano. We get to see a healthy Matt Milano with a progressing Terrell Bernard. I think Dorian Williams showed a lot of flashes last season as a as a rookie player. I think Balen Spector played better than everyone expected when we when we put him and thrusted him into action as a seventh round pick. He yeah. showed that he has some awareness and have some sideline to sideline ability and then some instinctiveness and a high IQ. And now we brought a over Nicholas Murrow from the Philadelphia Eagles, who had a trust uh, a tough stretch last year where they ultimately end up losing, but that was a, a winning organization he came from. So uh, these five linebackers we have here with the Buffalo Bills, I'm really comfortable with. I'm going to go ahead and give them a B plus. I can honestly say that I think this is the best linebacking core that the Bills have had, and that. Terrell Bernard has outplayed expectations. We yes. sat here last year at this time and we're like, who is this guy? Is he outside, inside? Is he calling plays? Like we we had no idea. He had no sample size for us to make any, you know, any kind of overall opinion of, of who he was. He was 
he, he, he didn't dress in the postseason like he was inactive, like all this stuff. And then, like you said, for Balen Spector to not have any reps like in meaningful games, for him to come in and, and be a serviceable backup, mm. I would take Nicholas Moreau, Balen Spector, and Dorian Williams over um, A.J. Klein. Now, I will say, you know, Terrell Dotson was a surprise last year too, and we lost him. Um, but good for him. He, you know, he got a, he, he got paid and good Mm -hmm. for him, but I feel like we were kind of gypped not being able to see full Matt Milano and Terrell Bernard. And I think it would have made a difference definitely down the stretch. I feel like it would have made a difference in the postseason too. I think there would have been, you know, some games that would have, the defense would have been able to step up, especially against in, you know, against the chiefs. I I felt like that game would have been different, but Mm -hmm. if you're giving him a B plus, I'm going to give him a, a B. Um, I, I feel like we have to make sure Matt Milano is healthy. Mm-hmm. Everybody says he's good to go. Um, I've been kind of yelled at by saying that he's injury prone. And I know some of the injuries are stuff that is kind of freakish things, but having that, that, that bone, you know, chip, like it is like, that could be something that he might have to deal with for the rest of his career. I don't know how that heals. I don't know if that's something they can replace, fix, put back in, in, in I, I'm not a doctor, so I, mm-hmm. I'll never claim to know that, but we'll have to wait and see. I mean, I just want for once, I just want a full season of healthy Buffalo bills defenders. If I feel like every year it's, it's a starting caliber player goes down and it's, it's, it stinks, but it's also kudos to Sean McDermott for being able to, you know, use the depth that he has and Brandon Bean and use the depth that he has to be competitive and damn near be, you know, a, a missed pass or a missed field goal away from having a chance to play in the AFC championship game last year. So, mm-hmm. all right. Where do you want to move on to next? I'll let you pick uh, on the offensive side of the ball. Offensive side of the ball. Let's go. <clears throat> let's talk receivers. Ooh. All right. Spicy. Let's, yeah. Let's get spicy. Let's talk. Let's talk receivers. We have uh Stefan Diz, Khalil Shakir, uh, Curtis Samuel, Mac Hollins, Justin Shorter, Andy Isabella, KJ Hamler. I'm, uh, I know we are missing a couple of names, but that that's the I guess the priority focus in my opinion. Right. Um, you know, I like the group. I think that you know is it's a good group. We have a uh, Khalil Shakir that's that's progressing. We're going to hope that he takes another step in progression. I want to ask you right quick about Khalil Shakir. How 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 much is the hype behind Khalil Shakir progressing and taking a breakout year, uh, taking a leap year or a breakout year this year compared to the hype that Gabe Davis had after the Kansas City Chiefs game? And he was uh, a, a hype player and talking about uh, having a breakout year and it, it probably didn't go to how we expected. How do you compare the, the hype between Khalil Shakir to Gabe Davis a couple of years back. Do you are 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 you more of a cause for pause in terms of okay, Khalil Shakir, I know you had a good season, but I've been through this already. Gabe Davis had this and he fooled me. You're not gonna fool me again. Or are you looking at looking at it as a separate entity uh as a uh, entirely and saying it, you know what, case by case basis. I'm I'm going to grade Khalil Shakir, and I think he's going to have that breakout year. I want to get your thoughts before we before we get into the greatest system. I got I got a an easy answer for you because I've been a Khalil Shakir supporter since he was drafted. Khalil Shakir is a better receiver than Gabe Davis. Oh, oh. You, I mean, you might as well clip this right now because I'm going to spit. I'm some going facts. to. I'm, I'm going gonna to. Some, I'm going to spit some facts right now. I'm going. If to. you if you go through the 2023 Buffalo Bills season down the stretch when no one else was getting open. Who was making plays? Khalil Shakir. He wasn't just lining up in the slot. He was going downfield. He was breaking tackles. He was getting first downs. His his completion percentage from Josh Allen is like 90%. His drop rate is like 1.3%, which is the lowest in the NFL. His target share compared to Stefan Diggs was half, and he had more receptions, more yards, and more touchdowns. Khalil Shakir is absolutely primed to have a breakout season. There's a huge difference between Gabe Davis because I believe after the Chiefs game, there was still some doubt because we knew, I think, at that point that Gabe Davis was going to give you big game Gabe, and then he was going to be, I can't get open Gabe, I'm dropping passes Gabe, I can't run the route tree Gabe, and that's not a knock on Gabe Davis. He was here for four years, he helped the team win games, he was a great guy in the locker room, team captain, all that stuff. 
Khalil Shakir doesn't, I get none of that vibe from Khalil Shakir. He catches everything thrown to him. He sat his rookie season and waited and waited and waited and waited. Now, I don't know if things were happening during practice where he was, maybe he wasn't a good blocker. Maybe he didn't know the entire route tree. Maybe he wasn't up to speed on the playbook. But I can tell you last year when his number was called, he answered. Uh And I can't say the same thing for Gabe Davis. And what what stinks about the whole thing is because when Gabe Davis was injured at the end of the year, Khalil Shakir stepped in and said, this is my job now. And Uh he produced. I I go back to that game against Pittsburgh when he made that play. I will never see Gabe Davis make uh, something like that. The the play against, I believe it was the second game against the Jets where he broke off that, that short, you know, it was a sideline route. And then he took it 85 yards to the house. That's something we will never see from Gabe Davis. Because Khalil Shakir can do more than just run deep and hold his hands like that and wait for a pass. He can run the route tree and line up inside, outside, and do everything that we want our two or three receiver to do. So my expectations for Khalil Shakir are through the roof. It's going to be interesting to see what Brandon Bean, Sean McDermott, and this offense has in store for him since they brought in Curtis Samuel, who some might say that he's a slot receiver slash an outside receiver. And everybody wants the Bills to draft a wide receiver. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But I I, I think consistency is key, right? That's mm-hmm. what we want. We want when you're targeted to make a play, and that's all we can ask for. That's why they brought in they and they drafted Dalton Kincaid because the guy doesn't drop passes and he gets first downs. That's ultimately what we want from our pass catchers, and that's what we get from Khalil Shakir. So in like many that. ways, Khalil Shakir is – playing for his next big contract. And I think if he produces the way he did this year, on top of the fact he's going to get more targets because he was more reliable, and they can't deny that when they watch film from last year and they're starting to install what what Brady wants to do with his offense. Because Shakir just made plays. Yeah. Plain and simple. Like, he made plays plays. when he was asked. And that's you can't ask for more more than that. So, obviously, I love Stephon Diggs. You know, he's our complete alpha male, number one receiver. He's always working hard. I guess I seen him. A, I seen a post of him the other day in the gym putting his work in like he always does. Uh, Khalil Shakir, I do expect uh, 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 him to continue to progress as the Buffalo Bills uh, wide receiver. I won't I won't be specific in terms of X receiver or slot receiver, but I, I, can, I expect him to continue to progress. Uh, Curtis Samuel, he's like that. You know the jack of all a jack of all trades player. He got that uh, explosive ability. He got the yak ability. You could put him in out on the outside. You could put him in the slot. You could line him up in the backfield. You could just do a multitude of things with Curtis Samuel. Mac Hollins, I think, provides some special teams abilities for the Buffalo Bills. He brings some some um, some special teams prowess there, and I think he'll be a, a an excellent number five receiver for the Buffalo Bills. Jordan Sh- Justin Shorter, I'm not sure about. And Andy Isabella and KJ Hamler, whether they like it or not, they they both of them obviously can't make the team. If one of them can make the team, one of them and only one of them is going to make the team. So they're going to be battling each other out. Um, Overall, when I look at the Buffalo Bills receiving core, I like it. I don't love it. I, I I would love to to add some more size there. I would love to add some more size. Very I would sure. lo- I would love to bump some players down in the depth chart right now. Diggs is number one. That's okay. Khalil Shakir Samuel's two and three. Wherever you want to put them, I would like to put another receiver between Shakir and Samuel. Bump down Mac Hollins to a number five receiver. I think those guys will be bigger components to the Buffalo Bills if they get dropped down one. So right now, I I like the Buffalo Bills receiving core. I don't love it. I'm going B minus. B minus. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people are talking about they want to get a weapon for Josh because ultimately we need to replace Stefan Diggs at some point, right? That there needs to be a contingency plan. Um, I want them to get aggressive in the draft. And this is my mindset that's changed over the last maybe week to 10 days. Get aggressive and go get a receiver. Why? Put him on the field because that's going to help Stefan Diggs. Mm-hmm. Because we've talked about it. And I think we talked about it almost every show. We talked about it a lot last year in our group chat. Stefan Diggs is warranting all the coverage because nobody they're not afraid of anybody else on this roster. They weren't afraid of Gabe Davis. Sh- Shakir was still kind of the unknown, right? Trying to work into what he was going to be. So now you add a Curtis Samuel. Now you have a Khalil Shakir that there's tape on. So I I think Stefan Diggs is going to have a big year. I honestly think he's going to have another 100 reception season, and he's going to get the 160, 165 targets. I I, I honestly do. I don't think he's 
slowing down like everybody says. Yes, he's hitting the back nine, if you will, on his career, at, you know, over the age of 30 and, and whatnot. But I still feel very confident in his ability to be a top five receiver. And it just there's there's not been anybody defenses just weren't afraid of Gabe Davis. They just weren't. When we had Cole Beasley, he warranted some cover. When there was John Brown, that warranted some cover. Emmanuel Sanders, that warranted a little bit of, you know, coverage. But when teams were able to shut down Stefan Diggs, it ultimately hindered what the Bills were able to do offensively. We'd get frustrated. Why is the offense so slow? Why are they starting so slow? Because Josh can't get Diggs into rhythm. That was part of the game plan. So now they're doing other things. And I think the more skill position players they add, obviously James Cook came along, mm -hmm. 50 plus receptions out of the backfield. Mm -hmm. Shakir's come on. Curtis Samuel, I think you can do whatever the heck you want with him. He's just, mm -hmm. he's Isaiah McKenzie 5.0 at this point. Like mm -hmm. I, I've uh, watching a lot of his film, he, you could do anything you want with him. I, I think he's still mm -hmm. got four, four ish speed. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm going to give him an A minus. I like this room. Really? And I think that, yeah, and I think that if they go and get aggressive and get a wide receiver, who are you covering if you can get one of these top five receivers? Who is warranting all that coverage? Because it can't be Stefan Diggs anymore. And like okay. the the statistics you brought up about Josh against man and zone, you got to remember Dalton Kincaid too. And you got mm -hmm. all these guys that if we get a speed deep threat, we have all these guys that can beat you underneath, and then we got the guys that can beat you over the top. So I give him an A minus. I, I I like the way the room is constructed. I'm not putting too much stock in Justin Shorter or Mac Hollins. I think those are special teams guys. I don't even know what Justin Shorter is at this point. Mm -hmm. um, if he's a practice squad guy again this year, I know he was on IR all of last year. Um, Mac Hollins definitely a special teams guy. He's going to be that small upgrade over Jake Kumaro. You might see him in, in certain packages where maybe he gets a deep ball thrown to him every once in a while or, you know, something over the middle just to get him involved in the game. But, yeah, I'm going A-minus on that. I like it. I like it. Um, All right, so let's go defense. Uh -huh. Let's go defense. So we let's did go. linebackers. Let's talk about safeties real quick. Not a ton to talk about there because we don't have hardly uh -huh. anybody on, under contract. Uh -huh. um, we got Taylor Rapp, Mike Edwards, DeMar Hamlin. Uh -huh. I'll let you go, and then I'll go after What's your opinion on those three? And this is something we've been talking about for a month now. Um, you know, I like it, don't love it. It's kind of the it's it kind of feels like beginning era Jordan Poyer, Micah Hyde. Right? It, that that's that's the vibe that I get with these two. I you know, these two are 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 solid players, good players. I think they're both overlooked. I think the Rams overlooked them a little bit. They was a they went second round pick, let them go. Uh, Mike Edwards been bouncing around. He's been a solid addition everywhere he went, but he's bounced around. He hasn't he hasn't stayed anywhere. So um, I think they're at at that point where they're trying to prove themselves as as in terms of everyday starting safeties, starting caliber safeties in the NFL. And um, uh, right now, I I like it. I'm not overly enthused. I would love to. <clears throat> continue to add safeties to the room. I, I would still love to, uh, a box safety to compete against Taylor Rapp. I would, I would love a, a free safety that would compete against against Mike Edwards. Uh, in my opinion, it, we're, we're solid, we're passing, but we leave a lot to be desired in the safety room. I'm going to see. Yeah, Julian Blackman hasn't signed yet, has he? He has not. Anywhere. I know he visited with the Jets and the 49ers. So he has not. So, I mean, why not add? I mean, I don't know if it's money at this point because the bills are running out until June 1st, then, then they'll have some money, but you giving them a C that's, I think that's pretty generous. I'm going yeah. C minus because yes. yeah. Taylor Rapp, small sample size, right? I know mm -hmm. he's won a super bowl and he's got some starting snaps before he came to the bills, but mm -hmm. there was a lot that needed to be cleaned up. Mm -hmm. I'm, I like the signing because it was consistency, time on task, like we always keep saying. I like that he was in Gosh, the building. He knows the system. There was just a lot of stuff that I didn't like. He needs to clean up the penalties. I, I don't mm -hmm. know about the run support that we got from Hyden Poyer before. Mm -hmm. um, and Mike Edwards, say what you want. Yes, he's got two rings, one with the Bucks and one with the Chiefs, but he's still kind of unproven to me. Um, I think – we talk this big talk about Sean McDermott being like the safety whisperer and stuff like that, but 
we don't know if it was just the perfect pairing of Hyde and Poyer. We don't right. know if those guys just right. understood the system so well that that fed into each other and what they did on the field for seven years, mm -hmm. and that's what made it so special. No doubt there was coaching involved, but we can't take away what the players did as well. Mm -hmm. um, and with and then obviously Demar Hamlin, and then we haven't talked about cornerbacks, but Cam Lewis is essentially. Well, little, um, he's the Curtis he Samuel on defense a little bit, right? Yeah, he can be safety or or, or corner, um, back up to Taron Johnson, if you will. But yeah, I'm going C minus. I I think it's get, definitely got to get addressed right. in the draft. That's definitely right. got to get addressed in the draft, and I think they should bring somebody else in that's got similar. I guess similar experience to Taylor Rapp and Mike Edwards doesn't have to be a flashy name, obviously, but somebody that maybe can work in the system that has traits that are similar to Hayden Poyer, bring him in to compete. Um, but yeah, I'm going C minus on that. So where do you want to go next offensively? I like it. Um, let's go offensive line. Uh, do you want to break that up with tackles, guard centers, or do, we, do you, can we talk O line as a whole? You want to do what we think is the starting line and then just talk about the rest of the depth or how do you want to do it? Um, yeah, we could, we could do that. We could do that. All right. So we got Dawkins at left tackle. Mm -hmm. uh, David Edwards at left guard. Connor McGovern is your center. Osiris Tor Torrance at right guard. And then Spencer Brown. So do you, do you believe – I'll start it like this. Do you believe that's the starting five heading into week one? Not in training camp. Heading into week one. <sighs> Against whoever we play week one. Probably the New York Jets. But what do you think? Right now, I have to think so. Yes, I do think that that is the starting line for the Buffalo Bills, how we are currently constituted or constructed right now. I believe that's the starting five for the Bills, yes. You don't think Will Clapp is going to get some run at center? I, uh, in camp? I, I, I think, you know, it's, you know, iron definitely sharp as iron. He's definitely going to provide that competition. Ultimately, I think Conor McGovern is, is going to win that job. Right. I, I, I just don't think Will Clapp is going to be now, of course, you may differentiate, but I don't think Will Clapp is going to be the starting center. I think he's going to be that depth piece. And if right. anything, if right. And if anything changes with Conor McGovern at center or moving back to guard, it's because of the play of of a, of a player we probably are going to draft. So right now, I think that's the starting five. Could you see uh, could you see a situation where possibly. David Edwards isn't performing and they thought Will Clapp played really well in training camp preseason at center with the reps that he got that they could move Connor McGovern back over to left guard for some continuity for playing next to Dion all of last year. He started all 17 games last year and then seeing what Will Clapp can do at center um, because I do think they're going to draft somebody at some point. I think it's – I mean, with 11 picks as it currently stands, I think one of those guys is going to be an offensive lineman, whether it be a tackle or a guard or a center. Mm -hmm. So what, what's your thoughts? I Without going too is, deep into this, because we can go down this well and it could just never end. Right, I, and I think that that definitely can be a possibility if he is struggling. You know, we might want to go back and, and change some things. So that that all depends on – the play of of David Edwards, right? If he can, if he struggles, then I think the Buffalo Bills staff and Aaron Cromer would definitely look into into making some changes. But under the Joe Brady offense and the zone concept that he liked to run and how he liked to pull and get guys in space, I believe the Buffalo Bills staff, that offensive staff, the offensive line coach, they want to use Conor McGovern's athleticism at the center position. So, you know, again, we'll see what happens. Uh, McGovern, I think he did a, a fine job last season with the Buffalo Bills, his first season playing guard. Uh, uh, you know, not a great run blocker, but I think he excelled in pass protection and, you know, protecting Josh is, is, is monumental. So I like the athleticism and the pass protection ability from Economy McGovern to, to shift over and play center. And I would hope the Buffalo Bills would just slide in a guard where they see fit somewhere in the draft mid-round. Yeah. Um, all right, so other guys that we have on the roster are Alec Anderson, tackle, Tommy Doyle, tackle, and Ryan Vandemark, tackle. Um, it's going to be actually really interesting. I know offensive line's not the sexy conversation of top, you know, to talk about, but it's going to be interesting to see because I think that they overperformed last year. I really do think with having, you know, Connor McGovern be new, 
having a draft pick in Osiris Torrance, well, as highly touted as he was, he's still a rookie, and we all know translating the college game to the NFL game is for linemen. Look at Spencer Brown. It took him, it took him two full seasons to finally get to where he's at now. It's going to be interesting to watch these guys have another season and see where it goes um, with Joe Brady's offense. Like you said, I'm going to give, I'm going to give him a, a B as far as my grade for them. What's, what's your thoughts? What's your grade? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and give the offensive line. Oof. I'm going to go ahead and agree. I'm going to go ahead and say a B as well. You know, I, I do think there is a little question mark with David Edwards there and you know but he does have he does have starting experience you know 70 games in his career uh, 45 career starts so I, I do think he's capable so hopefully Dave, david Everett can come in and and just make it a seamless transition for the buffalo bills i will say this one more thing before we move on spencer spencer brown last year his contract i wouldn't be surprised if the buffalo bills add a right tackle yep. mid round some point mid round to develop him and see what happens uh, at the end of next season with Spencer Brown, his contract, and how much he may or may not be worth. Yeah, I, Spencer Brown was one of the guys. I was just going to say he's. It's very interesting to see if he can continue the level of play. Mm -hmm. No injuries, knock on wood. There was no injuries. He played really well last year. He was a, a, a bright surprise for us. We talked about it, you know, either last week or the week before about we didn't have to talk about him. Mm -hmm. at all and that's always good when you don't have to talk about offensive linemen because that means that they're doing they're doing their job all right let's go back switch over to defense let's go corner mm -hmm. um we got rasul douglas christian benford kyra elam taron johnson i guess we can throw cam lewis in there mm -hmm. all right before we start who's cb1 and we've done we've talked about this before mm -hmm. i just want to see if you're sticking to your guns who is cb1 I, I'm sticking to my guns. You know, Rasul Douglas is the CB1 for the Buffalo Bills. When Devontae Adams is out there, when Garrett Wilson is out there, when uh, 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 Justin Jefferson or, or, or Jamar Chase is out there, I'm going to go ahead and, and line Rasul Douglas opposite the number one receiver. So you think he's more physical than Christian Benford? I think he's more of a complete player right now than Christian Benford. So you I, think it's more IQ-ish type deal? I, th I think it's reacting I, I, awareness type deal. I, I think it's IQ reacting awareness. I think um none of them is, is are blazers, but I think he is a little quicker, a little faster than Christian Benford. But there's no knock on Benford, man. I'm not this this is not a knock on Benford. Right. He's a physical corner. He's a big corner. Um, uh, he shows up in, in, in run fits in the run game. I, I really like the aggressive nature of Christian Benford. And it's honestly a good discussion, good argument to have. But uh, watching Rasul Douglas come over and, and, and make impact plays for the Buffalo Bills and have turnovers and score touchdowns on the defensive side of the ball, that's something that we needed. We needed those big plays in crucial yeah. moments. And Rasul Douglas was able to provide that. So because of that, I do still have him as my number one cornerback. Yeah, I think that's part of the conversation is because not a lot of the flashy stuff was happening coming from Christian Benford. It seemed like if there was a forced fumble or, or a pick six or something in a, in a big game situation, it was Rasul Douglas. Um, but people don't realize, and I brought this up before, the number eight and number 11th best rated cornerbacks in the NFL, according to PFF, if you like them or not, they watch every snap of every player of every game. That The eighth was Christian Benford and the 11th was Rasul Douglas. And if you start digging deeper into not just, okay, how many receptions did he allow or how many yards did they give up or pass breaks? If you look into other things like the analytics of, you know, how many times were they put on an island? How many times, uh, what's what's the opposing quarterback's rating when targeting said corner? Christian Benford was like number three. He had like the third lowest quarterback rating when he was targeted. And then it, it became a point where, I think teams were trying to pick their poison between Rasul Douglas and Christian Benford. It just, it really stinks that we didn't get to see Douglas in the postseason playing like he played because he was injured, right? We didn't get to see him play like he played down the stretch. And I absolutely think this is the probably the second best trade that Brandon Beans obviously ever made besides Stefan Diggs. So um, we didn't talk about Kyer Elam. I do want to talk about Kyer Elam because I feel like he is kind of the unknown in this whole cornerback room because in our group chat, I was joking that the Bills are going to draft a corner. It's probably not going to be early. It's probably going to be day three, but they're going to draft a corner, and that guy is going to 
push Kyrie Elam in it. I, who knows how that turns out? I mean, a lot of people said that we need to give him a chance. It's year three. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just the inconsistent play with me. Just I something, something about it just doesn't sit right with me. For a guy who's the number one pick that we moved up to get, it's just in two years in the system, you know, he's touted as being one of these physical guys. Like he just, I don't know if he just shoots himself in the foot with the holding penalties, but then he'll go and he'll make an amazing interception, in, you know, mm-hmm. in a crucial moment of the game. Like that, that's the baffling thing about it. Like it seems like he understands the playbook, but then there's times when it does, he just, he can't get an advantage on a receiver. And it, it just, it drives me nuts. What's your take on Kyrie Elam real quick? Uh, again, I think he has all the athletic tools, all the athletic ability um, is all there for him. I, I think his, his learning curve was a little steeper because we're talking about uh, a guy that is is probably more traditionally known as a man cover corner that got selected in his own base scheme. So now not only does he have to continue to progress and, put, and develop on an NFL level, but he has to continue to progress and develop in a scheme that is probably not suited best for him or a scheme that he probably wasn't accustomed to playing right. in, in college where he was able to show his strength. So in year three, I'm hoping he can still develop and progress. I'm hoping that he's watching a lot of film and, and a lot of that film that he watched, he can take to the football field. I'm hoping that Kair Elam has that year three jump like Spencer Brown had on the offensive side of the ball. That's the hope. Uh, so we'll we'll see what that if, if that actually happens. He's the most athletically gifted skill position player on the defensive side of the ball Buffalo might have. So I would hope he can actually develop and get a chance to use his physical abilities and traits. So is there any reason, and I don't want to keep going on Kyrie because I know, I know we got other uh, position groups to talk about. Is there any reason to think that Brandon Bean chose the wrong corner? And it's no knock on Kyrie Elam, like you said. Mm-hmm. Is he built for a different system? Is he mm-hmm. built to be a more physical man coverage defender? And the Bills predominantly don't – they don't do that. They do it when they need to, right? It's not like they don't ever play man. But mm-hmm. – we talk about Tredavious White all the time and how he was built for Sean McDermott. He basically was built to be that zone corner to, mm-hmm. for Sean McDermott. Mm-hmm. Is this a case of they tried to get a guy with the physical traits that they thought can mold into what they wanted a cornerback to be? What do you it's think? De- it's definitely possible. It's definitely possible when you know uh, you show your hand, you tip, you tip your hand a little bit and – the rest of the league kind of knows you. You need to go corner. You need a corner. So when you need a corner, <clears throat> you have to look at, okay, my guys are off the board, but my, one of my guys are here. He probably wasn't the first, second, or third guy I was going to choose, but uh, I believe in my coaching staff. I believe in the system, and he has a lot of athletic traits that you can't teach. So hopefully right. we can marry the two and come up with a solid prospect by the end of his four-year uh, contract or five-year contract with the Buffalo Bills, but this third year will be telling if he does get a fifth-year contract. Right now, it's not looking like it. Gotcha. All right, you want to pick this group? Keep it, keep it moving. We'll keep it moving. If you guys are watching on YouTube, please smash the like button, hit the subscribe, hit that bell for notifications, so you know <clears throat> not when just only the Founders Pod goes live, but when all of the other shows on the channel go live. Um, smash the like on Facebook. Please share this. And if you're watching on X, please like this and comment. Tight end position. Dalton Kincaid, Dawson Knox, Quentin Morris, Trey McNitty, and Zach Davidson. Uh, I really like the Buffalo Bills tight end position group, obviously headlining by Dalton Kincaid and Dawson Knox. Dawson Knox. I'm actually looking forward to seeing Dawson Knox play this season. I'm looking forward to a Dawson Knox bounce back year. You know, he he battled a lot of injury last year. He had that wrist injury slash surgery last season. He didn't have the season that uh, we would expect from Dawson Knox, especially the contract he's being paid, 22 receptions, 186 yards in 12 games, two touchdowns. So um, I'm definitely looking forward to a, a, a Dawson Knox uh uh, bounce back season. He has 
similar things going on in terms of what he can do on the field with Dalton Kincaid. And when you add those two and you blend those two together along with the rest of the Buffalo Bills weapons, the tight end group from a passing perspective in terms of a Mitch match nightmare perspective, I think it's it's a, an above average one. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a, a B plus. I give it a B plus because of all the advantages in terms of the receiving game you have, especially if you have a Dawson Knox at tight end two with the physical abilities he have. Uh, it would have been an A if somebody could block. If somebody was just a road grader as a blocker, I would have gave the position group an A, but I like it enough as a receiving core. I think Dalton Kincaid is going to be special, B+. Plus. I think the guy that can block doesn't see the field. That's Quentin Morris. Mm. He's mm. never going to see the field, though. Um, you know what's interesting? Um, because I feel like the Bills kind of showed their hand a little bit on how they're going to use their tight ends. It went away a little bit because Dawson Knox was battling some injuries. But I feel like Dawson Knox is going to be your red zone guy, and Dalton Kincaid is going to be the in-between the 20s guy the third and eight takeover for Cole Beasley guy um, because he's not a great blocker. We all know that you just touched on that. I think Dawson Knox is somewhat of a mismatch and we've seen a lot of his good, big, huge plays where we're like, Holy cow, there he is, is in the red zone or in, you know, within striking distance of a touchdown. So Quentin Morris is what he is. I think it's a great guy to have as a third, a third stringer. Um, but I, I give this group an a minus because I think the untapped potential of Dalton Kincaid can't, it just can't be spoken about enough. This guy can have a hundred receptions this year. If the bills choose to use him that way, um, say what you want about his blocking ability. And he may be a liability. If you need to take him off the field to bring a bigger receiver or another tight end in, but the guy's hands are ridiculous. And there wasn't many times this past season, you could talk about the Bengals game where he fumbled fine one, one play out of the whole year, but Dawson Knox, I feel like taking the the you know restructured contract and ultimately taking a pay cut, I feel like there may be some foreshadowing there that this is a make or break season for for Dawson Knox. Um, mm. And I'm not just throwing that out there because I, I love Dawson Knox and I love where he was when the Bills drafted him to to earning that second contract and becoming that that tight end threat that the Bills haven't had in so many years. So it's going to be interesting to see how Joe Brady lines them up, if they're going to run 12 personnel, if they're going to run 11 personnel, whatever the option is with their tight ends. I think it's going to be extremely intriguing. Um, but like you said, I don't want to bring in Mac Hollins because our tight ends can't block uh -huh. because I want those guys because of their blocking ability and pass catching ability. And that's, that's, it seems like we got Kincaid, but he's, he's a liability in blocking. So uh -huh. um, I don't know how, how they would upgrade that this off season. And if those guys are going to, going to be utilized as weapons. Um, but yeah, I give them an a minus overall. I like it. I like it a lot. All right, let's move on. Um, we have two position groups left. We got, well, three, if you count, you want to do special teams real quick. Yeah, we could do it. Knock it out right, the way. I give him a C Tyler uh, Bass needs to figure it out. Yeah. I said last year that he was a liability and, he became a liability. Do I like the guy? Yes. I don't know if it was the holding from Sam Martin. I don't know if he got in his head somehow, but the dude was automatic for like two years. And then last year it was like anywhere there was a field goal. It was like, I, I was concerned if he was going to make it or not. Um, and then obviously we know what happened in Kansas city. I'm not blaming him for that loss. So I'll, I'll never go there. Um, but we got Tyler Bass. We got two punters under contract and then we have Reed Ferguson. So I give him a C it's average. Yeah. I like it. I like it. You know, the okay. punter, the punters aren't great. You know, Tyler Bass, 24 for 29. He missed the extra point last season. I don't know what the heck is going on with Tyler Bass. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, hopefully he can he can have a better season this season. And he got paid too. Let's not forget he got right. paid. Right, exactly. And that's why I don't I, I hate that's why I, don't, I hate to hear the talk. Well, he, the holder's important. Nah, you're not giving the he holder that money. You got paid that money. You're not giving 25% of that salary to right. the holder. <laughs> So make, is out. Yeah, make make your make your damn kicks, man. Even if I'm holding, make your make make the damn kick. <laughs> uh, all right, let's do. You want to do running backs? Yeah, let's short do list. Backs. Yeah, let's do running backs. All right, we got James Cook and Ty Johnson. I'm not going to practice squad, guys. Um, yeah, uh, I like it. You know, uh, I, I think I would love a, a guy to put in between James Cook and and, and Ty Johnson. 
Uh, I, I love Ty Johnson. I love his game. Uh, his, his stats didn't wow you, but when the Buffalo Bills needed a spark and he needed or needed some productivity out the running back position, he was able to come in and and provide that. Ideally, I would love him as a running back three. So right now, I have a a, a B minus for the Buffalo Bills running back room until we 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 add that guy. Once we add that guy, that can turn to a B or depending on what happens. Yeah, you know, we we talked about you know, who we wanted when we did our free agency preview show, like who we wanted um, as far as running backs. And at this point, you know, I love James Cook. I've been a huge let James Cook, you know, stand for, for two years now. Um, I feel like he can be here for a while if the Bills want to, unless they're going to do this rinse, repeat, remove, you know, move on type of deal. Mm. Um, I think he's going to be a huge asset. I think he's going to get utilized a lot more. We have to remember too, the touches that he got in 2023 were, the mo- the most touches he's had in his entire professional career of playing football mm-hmm. Com- compared to when he was in college in mm-hmm. his rookie season, he carried and, and, and caught more passes than he did all that combined. So mm-hmm. we got to cut him some slack and like, let him kind of marinate a little bit and kind of just hopefully the progression is going to continue to go. I don't know what else the guy can do. Um, there's certain games where he took over and he looked like he was a top 10 back in the NFL. Um, he's got to clean up the drops. A hundred percent has to clean up the drops in key moments. Um, and then Ty Johnson doesn't, I mean, I know you like him a lot. He's a good guy to have to mm-hmm. give a couple carries to a game, maybe a couple passes thrown to him, mm-hmm. bring him in for blocking every now and then. But I think that they finally need to stop doing this, bring in a veteran guy for a one-year deal. Bring in a veteran guy for a one-year deal. Just go and draft a guy that you like, that you can get, and you can maybe bring him into the system, groom him organically, give him some carries, and he's young. There's not a lot of wear and tear on it because ultimately Latavius Murray wore down last year. Like That's why he was so ineffective at the end of the season. It's because he's he's 49 years old. Like He's older than me, and he's out there trying to get a two-yard gain, and he can't even get two inches. So – Let's get younger at the position um, and draft somebody on day three that you know that can be groomed and potentially work. And if that guy comes into camp and or into you know the season and he's not great, there's always free agent running backs out there that can uh, be RB twos uh, uh-huh. because you got to take a chance, right? Uh-huh. Brandon Bean seems to find these guys in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round that come come in and compete and can be a stalwart in this back in this you know, running back room for, for three or four years. And then we don't have to do this next year. Plus he's cheap. Right. And he's young. So I give, I give, yeah, I give the running backs, a I give him a B minus B minus. I like it. All right. So we got left is the defensive line. Yep. Um, Von Miller, Gregory Rousseau, AJ Epinesa, Casey Tuhill, Ed Oliver, Daquan Jones, Austin Johnson, this, this, Deshaun Williams, that's all I got. I thought those was those were the main focus of the defensive line. Epinesa? Did you say Epinesa? Yep, Epinesa. Okay. Mm-hmm. Those eight guys. Um, you could throw in um, Kingsley Jonathan. You could throw in uh, Ankil, the the other defensive tackle. Um, I, let's start with you, Dave. What you think? Because I'm I'm kind of conflicted with the defensive line. I'm a little conflicted. I'm extremely conflicted because we talked about it before. We got younger at some positions, but we're still kind of old at other positions, right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of weird because we got a young Greg Rousseau and we got a young AJ Epinesa. I think those are guys that they drafted, they want to develop. And I feel like I put, I posed the question about should the Bills pick up Greg Rousseau's fifth year option? And then Brandon Bean this week at the owners' meeting said, we absolutely, that's something we're going to do. So that's, mm-hmm. I found that to be interesting. So mm-hmm. we have him under control for two more seasons, which is nice. Um, they went and got Casey Tuhill, which I, I really don't know what to think. He he had flashes when they got rid of Montez Sweat and Chase Young with the Commanders. He came in and he he played well. Um, but then you have Von Miller, and I'm kind of conflicted. Like I don't know. I'm hoping for the best. Like we're going to get a good version of Von Miller, but I have no idea. No idea. Mm-hmm. And then with the defensive line, like I love Ed Oliver. And one thing about Ed Oliver, and I've said this now f- like four shows in a row that. People need to get off the man about how he performed down the stretch, please. Mm-hmm. We we bitched and complained for two or three years about, you know, is 
is is the first round draft pick is it ever is the hype ever going to pay off the guy shows up once every four games makes a play we think he's the greatest defensive tackle and then he disappears for three weeks three weeks uh-huh. okay well he got paid some of us were kind of pissed about it some of us were like it's deserving some uh-huh. of us were like well let's see it play out ed oliver was not your typical Sean McDermott rotational defensive tackle last year. Look at the snap counts compared to all of the other DTs on the roster. Uh Twice as many. So we have to understand that down the stretch, he might have been feeling that on his body down the stretch. He might not have been able to perform to the standards he played. And I'm not giving him excuses. I'm putting that on Sean McDermott. Because if you're going to let a guy play 70% of the snaps, the whole season, when the season before he played 50% of the snaps, you have to figure it out down the stretch. Now, I know the Bills were trying to win games, put all of the best pieces in place. They had injuries on defense. Daquan Jones was out for two-thirds of the season. I, I understand that. But at some point, you have to look at a guy and say, I'm pushing him too hard. I, at some point, I need to give him some spells in situations where I might not want to, but he has to to prolong his season. So... I think with Ed Oliver, you know what you get. I think we're going to get another repeat of what he was last year. Um, Daquan Jones is, is 32 years old, if I'm if I'm correct. He's 32, correct? correct? He's coming correct. off from that injury, mm-hmm. the pectoral injury. Maybe his body doesn't heal like it did when he was 24 years old, mm-hmm. right? And he signed a two-year contract, so he's going to be here for two years. I'm excited because I like what I saw before he got injured. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, Deshaun Williams, okay. Austin mm-hmm. Johnson, not really putting the fear of God in anybody, you know, against the run. Mm-hmm. Kingsley Jonathan, we talked about, you know, okay. Um, Eli Anku, okay, dev piece. So overall, I think this is a need in the draft. And we talked about it last week. Mm-hmm. Um, my grade for them is a C right now because I have no idea what I'm getting with a, a few of these guys. Mm-hmm. And that includes Daquan Jones. That includes Vaughn Miller. Mm-hmm. So we'll see. What's what's your take? Yeah, I have to agree. I have to agree with that. I agree. I think this is our, our second one we agree on. I, I got to give it a C. We don't know what we're going to get with Von Miller. Maybe we need we can need to put a C with an asterisk or a subject to change, depending on how Von Miller plays, right? But um, we don't know. We hope he can play and provide that spark because we are. We, we where is the pass rushing coming from? It has to come from here. Leonard Floyd is no longer here, right? Right. Uh, how much? How much of a pass rusher is Gregory Russo? How much of a pass rusher is AJ Evanessa? We, we spoke about Ed Oliver going from 50% of snaps to 70% of the snaps. Well, the D-line that may have took a hit this year where he might have to play 80% of the snaps. Is right. he is he going to be durable and uh, up to the challenge and be as productive as he can be? So it's definitely a lot of question marks within the defensive line that seamlessly is the starting defensive line, but it's, it's, it's because of the injury to Von Miller and because I do think uh, there are some question marks with some debt pieces where I have to give this a C. And I think that defensive line is definitely a priority need in the NFL draft. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised, and people would hate it, but I wouldn't be surprised if this is a priority in the draft, defensive and, and defensive tackle. I wouldn't be surprised. Because what's the contingency plan for Daquan Jones and your one tech to go next to Ed Oliver? You right. can't just keep rehashing these. 30 plus vets because there's going to be mm-hmm. times when it doesn't work out. I mean, mm-hmm. the Jordan Phillips tenure has got to be over. over, right? It's got to be over the, the Shaq Lawson, no knock on Shaq. I love, he's a great guy. And I think mm-hmm. he played his ass off for the team mm-hmm. every year. He's come back. Mm-hmm. Um, that has got to be over. over. I think mm-hmm. That's the Casey two Hill is, is the Shaq Lawson, re, you know, replacement. We need to see something from AJ Epinesa who just got a decent contract. We need to see something from Greg Rousseau who's going to make $19 million in 2025 Mm -hmm. because that's what his fifth year option price tag costs. Mm -hmm. We need to see something from Von Miller. I understand you took a pay cut because you want the -hmm. bills to be able to have money because you want to be a GM and you know what it takes and in this. And I don't, I don't, there's the time for talking is over. Like the other guys, the bills brought in for defensive tackle. They may be great guys, but they're not, I don't think they're scaring any offensive game plan. I really don't. And it it needs to be addressed. And people don't understand what a heavy defensive line rotation means to what the the back seven does for the bills, especially the linebacking core. If you have a strong front four, these linebackers as great as they are, they will be that much better. That's why when we brought in Daquan Jones and Ed Oliver started to come into his own. And when they brought in Vaughn Miller, look at what it did for Tremaine Edmonds. Yep. Jermaine Edmonds had his best season when they brought in Vaughn Miller, right? Yep. 
because they were able to create pressure, which was able to create lanes for these linebackers to do what they wanted to do. Matt Milano was an all pro because of the defensive line play, not only because of it. So don't, don't, I don't want people taking me out of, out of context here, but Mm -hmm. everything feeds everything else, right? Right. The front four feeds the back seven Mm -hmm. and it has to start up front. The bills have talked and Brandon Bean has talked for six years now going into the drafts that it starts up front. The game is won and lost up front. Yes. And they have to make it a priority. Not offensively, I think we're good there, but defensively they have to make it a priority to figure it out. Because I don't think that they have a defense right now on the front that is capable of stopping the run consistently. Say what you want about Greg Rousseau and his 900-inch wingspan. I don't think that it scares teams into not running the ball against the Bills. I really don't. Do right. we get some added pass rush presence from Ed Oliver and Daquan Jones? Sure. Yeah. Uh-huh. But I, I think that there needs to be a contingency plan if those guys are only on the field for 50% of the snaps. So I agree. I agree. So that's all I got. I appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, we have right now over 500. So if you guys haven't smashed between all three platforms, so if you haven't smashed the like, please do so before we get out of here. Hey, Rich, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Happy Easter to everybody out there. Enjoy mm-hmm. time with your families tomorrow. I know I will. I know, Akeem, you got Definitely. plans for your family. Anything yep. else you want to say before we get out of here? No, nah, man, I think we touched on uh, touched on a lot of good stuff today, uh, a lot of great work, great topics, and especially during a slow week, man. It's, it's, you know, as content creators, it could be challenging when there are not – any newsworthy events or notes going on with your team. So to be able to come here and have this dialogue and communicate and uh, put on a great show and and the, for the fans to be entertained and have their own little discussions on the side, I think it was a, a excellent show tonight, man. I think we touched on a lot. And um, again, next week, we probably start working our way into right. the draft a little bit next week. And I think we're going to open up those can of worms. So same time next week. Uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Founders Podcast. We appreciate everybody for tuning in. and uh, I think I'm good. Yeah, we'll see you guys next week. Please enjoy Easter. Um, we'll be back next week. We'll, we'll Like Akeem said, we'll start breaking in the draft. So that's it for us, guys. Thank you all, for everybody that tuned in, everybody that commented. We will see you next week. As always, go yes, Bills. Sir. Go Bills.